size of the meat here, so right measure to the here. And uh, I'll try to give you this morning a short introduction to uh, uh, SWAS, but I'm going to explain you what it is about and data in the point acquisition and how we can actually make use of these methods to go <coughs> with uh, high throughput targeted procurement. So uh, I'm coming from the group of the other side in Zurich, where it was you know, so important in here. I wanted to ask you maybe just to have a quick impression about the audience. Somebody of you have already heard about SWAS? Is your familiar or data independent data independent acquisition? Or you're mostly like yeah, okay. So the other ones are more like SM oriented. So I tried I try as much as possible to do parallel with SRM, but you can see that actually the not the data itself, but the way we analyze the data is very conceptually very similar to SRM. So that you don't have to be any scared about this. This is just kind of, you can rethink of it like a high school with SRM method in the first step, let's say. And I will try to show you how much more you can get out of your data compared to SRM. So I try to drive you a little bit through the different methods. And the first uh, maybe big comment is to explain you why we came up to this idea and why we needed something between shotgun and SRM to quantify proteomes. <coughs> and I guess you, you might already know and you might already have discussed it in, in other uh, topics. So what, what we want ideally in proteomics is to quantify a large set of proteins across a large sample cohorts. And this we want to do with good consistency, uh, rap rapidity, accuracy, and you know that in shotgun you actually get a quite high number of, of protein identifications. But however, because of the virtue of the sampling of the shotgun, etc., you get quite a low consistency in protein IDs. You can recover a little bit of that with MS1 level three quantification and map alignments. But still, the reproducibility is not as high as you would wish. <coughs> and on the other side, it's a very complementary technique. This is the plus and the minus of quite a other. You have the target proteins like SRM, where you have actually very high consistency and accuracy and sensitivity because you focus on machine of specific uh, targets. <coughs> However, you lack on rapidity because you just can acquire as fast as your machine can do. And uh, <coughs> this already story from shotgun to target proteomics was suggested by uh, Rudy Ebersons in uh, back about 10 years ago that they say like in shotgun you were basically rejecting the same sample we are always picking up the highest intense species and you were rediscovering over and over the same thing so they decided in this year actually to switch from shotgun to SRM and our lab has been uh, uh, you know, we now have a long history of developing targeted proteomics in order to go deeper and more consistent across several cohorts. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> this is to show you, I will show you a lot of these maps, maybe you're familiar with this, so uh, just to show you again the difference between shotgun and targeted proteomics. And here you see here is the retention time axis, and this is the mass of a child axis, and each time you see this, you know, like, uh, uh, what we call MS1 features, so these are basically the isotopy distributions of the different peptides they do things. So the blacker, the, the darker the, 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 the dots, then the more intense. So you have to think that these basically species are like mountains that come towards you, and then it so go towards you, and then go down. So this is like a 3D representation of the LCMS maps that you get in your samples. So I try to have the same map of uh, peptides analyzed by shotgun and target proteomics. You see here that the axis is not that big, it's 650 uh, to 700, and this is about like 10 minutes of retention time. So, what shotgun does basically, it tries to figure out what are the most intense species that you see at every single scan. So, the scans are in these directions. So, at these scans, the most intense species are obviously this one, it's between 4 and SMS. And you see here the red arrow represents the, the acquisition window, so the isolation window where the machine selected the precursors and fragmented for an SMS. And in principle, you see that uh, in shotgun, you try to basically 
uh, acquire as many MSMS as possible for as many species as possible. So you try to cover as much as you can the space of analyze, and you try to acquire as many MSMS as possible as fast as the machine can. So it's a very fast, you get high number of identifications. However, it's not consistent with your sample. So if you shoot the same sample exactly the same trial <coughs> twice, maybe this will not be fit in the second injections, but maybe this species will be fit in the second injection. So this is a little bit of problem because your chromatography is not so reproducible, and therefore you need to have uh, the, the, this method by itself because it's the machine decides on the fly which one it picks or which one it doesn't pick, and therefore it's not so reproducible in terms of sampling of the of the analyzed inside your samples. And it's instrument driven, so the machine decides on the on the fly, and it's obviously biased towards higher than all species. So it's always in priority the highest rate species and then goes as low as it can until the speed of the machine is reached. And it's rather low sensitivity because <coughs> usually because of this you will never manage to get to the low intense species in principle. And the major feature is that basically uh, each MSMS spectra is a snapshot of a different peptide. So you acquire many many of such MSMS spectra and each of these pictures is in principle different from each other. And that's the virtue of that's why it's so fast in identifications. So in comparison now, you have the target hypothermics approach. And there you actually basically force the machine to take only um, very restricted speci uh, species of your, of your sample. <coughs> so for example, here you focus on that peptide, on that peptide, <coughs> here you don't see very well maybe on that peptide, and here on that peptide. So here you see that it's very different. What you have here is that each MSMS series now is not like a different species, but it's basically the recording of one peptide across the chromatographic dimension. So you force the machine to take over the, set, the same picture over and over and over across the chromatographic dimensions. And what you get is basically uh, an MSMS spectra of the same species. So at the beginning there is nothing. And then there is a little bit of peptide coming up. The primers increase and the primers decrease when the, when the peptide is gone. So basically here you acquire the fragments over time and you use those MSMS fragmentation in order to reconstitute the evolution profile of the peptides. So what you get in SRM basically, you don't actually visualize the MSMS. What you do, you actually focus your also your search protocols into specific fragment masses. And what you record is basically the intensity of these fragments arising <coughs> and decreasing depending on the evolution of the peptide. So the big difference here is that, as you can imagine here, you get a very consistent and accurate quantification because you have a chromatographic area which you can integrate, and it's uh, user-driven, so the machine is not anymore deciding what it wants to do. You're forcing, you as a user is forcing the machine to select the peptides you want. You have a much higher sensitivity because you can focus the machine on very low amount of peptides, and unfortunately you have a very low number of precursors that you can run for tolerance. So these are the really like almost completely antithetic uh, methods. One is very fast, but it's not so consistent and not so sensitive. The other one is very consistent and sensitive, but it's not so fast. And uh, just to mention also, our lab has have a long history of actually now uh, using target hypothermics. And for this, we've spent a lot of time and efforts and money in recording what we call spectral libraries. So you've heard already maybe from Olga, about the MTV spectra libraries. The work was uh, also uh, started in our lab with Paula Kukachi. And uh, what she started with was a list, for example, this is the list of open ring crimes, so it's about 6,600 proteins for which she selected the peptides, did the uh, 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 order the synthetic peptides for each of these proteins. So these are many, many peptides, so we comment about the numbers in a minute. She records the libraries on triple quads, on, uh, on uh, all the traps, and then you basically manage to get an SRM assay library that you can use for target hypothermics. So this is to give you kind of an impression about the atlases and the number of assays that we have available in our lab. So this it's about 30,000 peptide assays, it's covering most 97% of the these proteins. Uh, this is the work of Paula Picotti. The, the human assays, we have about 200,000 assays. This covers 99% of the human proteins. We also have specific subspecific assays like M-glycosides, SNPs, slice variants, which represent 
which are interested for us in terms of biomarker project, in terms of uh, significant splice for like cancer discovery projects, etc. And uh, this was done mostly in collaboration with the former group of UV in Seattle, as well colleagues. And we were yesterday from all, uh, two days ago from Olga about the TV. It's about 15,000 assays, so we know some of the protein of the TV. And they are more to come with different steps and etc. So we spend a lot of time and effort building those libraries, which are very valuable and you can download basically for your own experiment. And we were wondering after acquiring all these uh, libraries, what's the best use we can make out of those? And obviously, as I told you, you can use it for short-term and spectralized researching. However, because what I told you, the sensitivity and the speed of the machine, there are many, many MSMX spectra that are not recorded by the machine, so we don't record the low-intensity shift, and there are too many things which might be used by short-term. Uh, SRM was the obvious case scenario where we wanted to use those libraries, and for this, it was, it's, a, it's a very well-working uh, method. However, of course, you cannot apply 30,000 or 200,000 peptides in your SRM, otherwise you spend months to measure your sample. Uh, so it's definitely a very good method for high sensitivity and going for low amount species, but you cannot really do a full protein classification with this method. And there, Rudy thought that we might be something which would sit in between shotgun and SRM that would allow us basically to make use of these assays and to try to quantify proteome wise, so the whole proteome of the certain organisms by using these assays. And there we came up, really came up with this idea of, of SWAS MS and targeted proteomics. So I will now, so this was for the introduction to show you a little bit why we actually tried to come up with another method which would basically combine the advantage of shotgun and SRM. And I'm going to present you now uh, some basic concepts about data and content acquisition. So I, I will be quite quick because I think tomorrow we will have also a talk from Matt Macross, which would also explain more about data and content acquisition, which now are valuable in many different flavors from many different instruments. I will focus a bit today about the acquisition mode, but not so much, and about the analysis method. Because this I haven't covered a lot in the past, but I think just to tell you, to give you also an idea about the different analysis that you can do with these data sets. So uh, I will first start with SWAS, because that's the one I'm going to speak about today. But just to say that this is only one flavor of data and method acquisition. That's the one we have been developing in our lab. And I will show you that some advantages and disadvantages. But just once you understand the concept with SWAS MS, you will understand all the concepts of PIA basically. So what we do basically, it's again the RCMS map that you have seen before, retention time and over Z. And here as you can see here, I also try to put in red arrows exactly like before, the basically the isolation window of the machine on which it performs fragmentation and SMS spectra of the species. And as you can see here, what we try, we try to cover now the entire mass range so we do this sequentially by basically scanning the mass range. So we scan basically from 400 to 1200. And you see the windows are actually much bigger than the one you saw before. There are 25 different windows. I'm coming to this in a minute. But uh, what's important is that you have kind of the similar concepts than in SRM. So what you have here in SRM, as you are acquiring the same precursor over and over the chromatographic space, here you acquire now not anymore single producer, but you acquire a, a, a range <coughs> of masses. For this range of masses, I told you it's 25 data width. And what we call here now, because it's not anymore precursor that you acquire, it's a band of mass, and this band of mass is called a SWAS. So a SWAS is basically the, the ensemble of the MS and spectra that you acquire to cross on the chromatogram for a given mass range. So for example, here you have the SWAS. 600 to 625. So here you acquire all the MSMS spectra of all the species and show in that window across the retention time range. And you have the same concept as you have in SRM. The cycle time is basically the time that it takes to come back to the same acquisition window. So it takes time for the machine to scan the mass range and starts again at the bottom. So it takes some time to come back to the same window again. So this is exactly like in SRM, depending on how many producers you scan and how many positions you have to come back to the same producer again. 
And the important is that we want to cover the whole mass range, 400 to 1200. This is the quadrupole uh, selection, basically, uh, limitation by your instruments. It's 400 to 1200. And we cover them. If you think you use 25 dozen windows, it's a simple mathematics. You need 32 such windows in order to, to 32 divided by 25 to get the same only mass range to cover. And if it's only in seconds per window, you can basically get the super two cycle time seconds to scan for this 32 spots. So you use 32 scans, and you can then takes about 0 0.1 seconds. And the big um, really message about this is that you do this over and over, so all this mass range across all the retention time range. And instead of compared to the SRM picture I showed you before, where you are judging just very sparse uh, selection of some very specific region in SRM, here you can see that the same thing is complete. So you get the complete MSMS fragmentations for each SWAS regions across non player chromatograms. So you basically get MSMS information for all possible detectable species in a single sample detection. So, and this is really what makes this method like what I call data independent acquisition because it means that data independent acquisition. The machine doesn't decide what to do. It doesn't decide based on the intensity of the of the peptides and the intensity of the granite. It's forced to pick the entire mass range over and over the chromatic one. So you basically all these data and different acquisition methods share these properties that you acquire MSMS of everything across the entire chromatic one. So depending on the method, it will take longer or less time. It will be more or less complicated because of the interferences and because of the multiplexing of the spectra. But basically, this is the common features to all the data independent approach. So to make things a little bit, um, maybe to, to, to put it a little bit more, <coughs> I, I want to spend a few minutes to explain you what the name SWAS comes from. And maybe once you understand this, you will, you will maybe visualize a bit better what the machine does and what it means in practice. So Rudy, once we started to develop this machine, Rudy asked me to come up with the name of the methods. And I was trying hard to find a nice name for the method. Mm -hmm. And uh, one night I was talking with my wife, who's working in uh, climate research. And then I was trying to describe her what I wanted to do with the machine. And then she told me that this is what they do in satellites was acquisition. So when they do Earth observation, what they do is basically um, you have a satellite that turns around the Earth and basically makes pictures of the Earth like this by bands. So the satellite is turning around the Earth, it's taking pictures of bands of the Earth, until of course you cover the entire uh, planet. And there you get a complete picture of the whole planet, right? So this is, and I think once you understand this, this is basically what we do with the mass spectrometers. We also acquire like bands of, of uh, MSMS spectra, and we try to acquire these bands such that they overlap a little bit and such that they basically cover and at the end of the acquisition, you get a complete picture of your sample in retention time and in mass space. And uh, just again, uh, SWAS is actually the first time I heard about SWAS. I went to the dictionary. It's actually a very old uh, English word that is used in agriculture for a long time. This is the space followed by the stroke of the side of the printing machine. So this is basically a SWAS. Here. So you have a tractor here that cuts the grass. It makes bands of cuttings on the grass. And you see that the similarity, of course, in the satellite, we use the term to explain SWAS acquisition. And we use now the term for mass spec in order to explain that we also acquire regions of masses like this until we cover basically on the mass space. So I hope with this analogy, you will now picture a little bit better what the machine does and what the data looks like, at least from the acquisition perspective. So, this is to give you a little bit of an impression that SWAS is not the first one, far from, and it's not the last one uh, from data independent acquisition. So you've seen that data independent acquisition has been already in the in the air from uh, almost 2003 when they started it actually in source fragmentation and only putting the uh, sample in a, in a tube without fragmentation cells. And you've seen that people have developed it with very different names and very different types of instruments, but they all share the same uh, concept. In, uh, in other words, that they want to acquire MSMS spectra for everything, 
the front down tenure match range and enforce the down tenure retention time space. And they do this without checking for existence or not of the papers. So this is the common really like definitions about this data and data acquisition. And people have followed these different methods with different windows of size. So you remember these red arrows I showed you? In SWAS, it's 25 datums. So some people have used much smaller windows. Some people have used much bigger windows. And they have been done on different instruments with different duty cycle, different specificity, dynamic range. I don't want to enter into the details about this. It's always the same concept. You want to require MSMS spectra of everything over and over and over the chromatogram space. And uh, really the big message, so probably tomorrow you will hear more about these methods by Mathematica, especially the new version like this is called MSX, where the multiplex basically also prefers <coughs> the different region of the chromatogram, which is a very nice, uh, uh, let's say, extended versions of, of the IA. And the, the basic message is that all these methods have to find the right balance between the speed of the machine, the sensitivity that you want to acquire, the resolution, and the specificity. So for some very, very small windows, because the machine are not so fast yet, you need to have many, many injections in order to cover the entire mass range. Because if you use such a small windows, you cannot cover with a certain cycle time enough of the mass range. So you need to inject your, your sample several times. And then each sample injections will basically cover a little bit higher and higher and higher mass range. So you don't have time to cycle through the entire space. So you need to cycle through a small window first. Then you do this again and again. So each of these methods have to compromise somewhere between the speed and the sensitivity and the resolution. But again, the major common core about this is that we want to acquire an SMS of everything time-wise and mass-wise. Mass Okay. So this is the big uh, message about that position later. And I won't today speak much because tomorrow I'm going to speak more about that position method. I want to touch a bit today about the analy analysis method. So once you have acquired your data, there is actually many different ways to analyze your, your samples. So there have been basically three main uh, uh, methodology that have been developed. Uh, the first one was basically almost like uh, like shotgun database searching. I'm going to speak about this in a minute. The, the one I'm going to speak a lot in the talk today is about the target data extraction. This is what makes the data looks like SRM. And then there was another one that got published pretty much together with our paper. This is the uh, <coughs> FTRM, where they do basically spectral library searching uh, of the data and data technician samples. So, but you have to think that these methods can be applied to any DIA uh, acquisition. So once you have acquired your data that have this complete MSMS acquisition of everything, you can apply any of these methods in any order that you want, basically. And they all have advantages and disadvantages, but they, this is basically completely disconnected from that condition. Once you have acquired your data, you can basically apply any data analysis tool that you want. And in order to answer the question that you want to answer. So the first one I'm going to speak about is the, the first one, is the MSC, what I call the MSC uh, type of workflow where you want to show your database section. So again, this is another representation. You have the retention time, and here you have the mass spectra, MS and MS spectra. Now you have to think that these are not anymore MS1, these are MS2 that you record over and over and over. And what you do basically in the MSC approach, you basically try to find clusters of fragment tiles that co-use together. So because when you fragment a certain precursor over and over and over, to re like exactly like in SLM, their fragments will also increase in time and decrease in time. And you can basically redecompose the fact that the fragments belong together if they exactly co-use and share the same fragmentation spectra. So this is exactly the same as SRM. But if you want to acquire only those traces of fragments, of transitions, you basically acquire an SMS spectra of all the species in your samples, and you try to you use a software that detects these features, and you try basically to find the features, the um, MSMS fragments, traces that basically most, uh, most likely or most accurately uh, code together. So this is the first step of this MSC approach to try to find the uh, co-duty traces, you cluster them together, 
then you try to find in your MS1 space uh, the most likely probability precursor trace. So this is the precursor. I will mark it with a, with a few star. And then once you have this, you basically recompose a pseudo MS MS spectra. So it looks now like a, almost like a shotgun MS MS spectra. So this is an MS MS spectra which is recomposed on the mass of the precursor. So the mass of the precursor information comes from the from the clustered uh, precursor trace that you have, so you know the exact mass and charge of this precursor. And the fragments here are the fragments that produce together and produce the precursor. So you recompose from scratch a very clean up because all the fragments that do not produce they don't appear anymore in this MS spectra. So this is a completely artificially recom recomposed MS MS spectra, which is decomposed from the clustered fragments and precursors together. And you can do this, of course, for one and for many other Do they? species. Yeah. Are, are you sure that, that they don't look at the precursors first and then find the fragments that come that, that match it? I or? think they do it together, actually. I'm not sure. Because, uh, well, I don't know. I think in the original uh, paper, I think they did this way. But now <coughs> they must have changed it since then. Okay. But if you look at the very first Jero, Jero Manos paper, I think they were like also doing this too. And they there are many start with the fragments and then... And yeah, then, oh, and okay. what they do is actually they use precursor, they also do a search, and then if they don't find the right precursor, they try another precursor. So there are some kind of precursive also iterations on database search. But conceptually, whether they start from the precursor or the fragments, uh, so yeah, maybe I'm, uh, I'm biased because now this is what we mean to ask. We now look for the fragments first and then we look for the precursor next. But um, yeah, so actually it's the same. And here you want to recompose your MS and spectra that combines the, the most likely precursors that produce the most likely fragments together. And you do this for all the species, so you don't care very much whether this species the precursors and whether the fragments they produce together, whether they actually, um, well, they need to have a slight difference in shape and retention time when they cluster together. But basically, you can, uh, you can recover as many fragments as you want. And the next step is basically to do a, a regular shotgun database search where each of the spectra, we compose the spectra or search in as the fragment in So this is the uh, this was the, let's say, the starting of the data driven acquisition workflows was implemented by workers that we call the MSC, and this was their major pipeline for searching their data. So this has been around now for almost like 10 years. People in, in waters, using waters instruments have been using this MSC. Now with uh, uh, different flavors, now they couple it with immobility, etc. But they still rely on some type of machine and, and database search in order to identify the samples. So the second approach, which I'm going to talk to you, uh, was published <coughs> almost simultaneously with the target hypothermic approach. It's, it's a little bit similar, but not completely. So what you have here, you also rely to some extent on libraries. The libraries might be I mean, uh, spectral libraries which have been acquired or might be also like theoretical connotation spectra from peptides. They have tried with both approaches. I think it's working most best with anyway fragmentation spectra that you have acquired originally once at least and to have the right interest of species. And what you try here is basically you want to find the best the match. So you want to match the spectra library assay under each of these scans. So at each of these scans basically what you try to do, you try to see if this species present underneath these scans. So the first scan you check, it's not there, it's not there, or oh, there's a little bit of fragments coming in here, bit of fragments. So at each of the spectra, you basically check whether this, this, this species, this, if you find under, buried underneath these multiplex signals, you try to see whether you find these patterns. So if you find these patterns, there is no patterns, you get a very bad scoring, and then you get a little bit of more uh, pattern matching, you get this orange, blue, and then green. And then you can basically uh, use, you use a simple scoring, which is basically a dot product. So if they have a good correlation with this, uh, with this assay that they search underneath the multiplex spectra, they get either a bad dot product 
the dark color increases and then gets better and better. This is where most of your peptides evolve and fragments. And then you basically recompose. Uh, can you don't use any more retention time space, but you're more more or less using kind of you're transforming your retention time into a storm space, which is that product story. And then you see <coughs> where is your peptide diluting depends where basically your, your stores is higher. So if you have a very complex sample, you might get spikes, which might be completely random at some other places, but where your peptide diluts, you get a very nice kind of peak, reconstitutive peak of the product. So you basically so you do this matching each scan. So for each scan, you get a, a dot product score of, of finding the spectra. So this is the probability of finding the spectra underneath these multiplex pictures. And then you compile this evolution score, basically. And once you have this, you can basically, uh, you can basically identify the peptide species. OK, so this was the second approach. And this is very different than, than MSC in the sense that they don't look for collusion of things first. They basically do this matching for each spectra, and then they, they compute separately the, the score uh, uh, evolution profiles, and where they find their peptide is where most of the scores are higher, basically. But they don't assume a priori that this fragment is true. They just basically blindly search for, at every scan, they basically search for the existence of that species, okay? So it's conceptually different than MSC, and then at the end, you also get an identification of your of your peptide species. And the last approach, this is the one I'm going to speak most about uh, today. This is what we call the targeted extractions. And here, you basically also need to start from a spectral library. And here, you do exactly like in SRM. You actually pre-select the top, let's say, four fragments of that of, of that spectra that you write in your transition list. Uh, similar, I will explain you a bit uh, later today about how we make these libraries for class. <coughs> and basically, we basically now don't acquire these fragments anymore like you would do in XRM, but we extract exactly like you would do like an extraction and chromatograms of MS1, we do an extraction and chromatograms of MS2, and then we, we check whether these fragments, they basically call you together. So we extract the top four fragments of these species here. And then we check whether these fragments go together. So we basically realign the, uh, we, we extract, so we do <coughs> extraction and chromatograms of each of these fragments. And then we check whether these fragments nicely go in the peak shape. And if they co we score the co And then we, we check whether this is the presence, uh, we check. This allows us to validate the presence and the <coughs> of this peptide. And the, I want to point here out the major difference compared to uh, SRM is that in the first step you can also use the same basic scoring parameters that you use in SRM that you've seen in the past days. So you look for pollution, peak shapes, relative right, densities, etc. But on top of that, because you're using DIA data, you also have access. You see here underneath, what is buried underneath is a complete MSMS spectra. So you can basically open the MSMS spectra at the top of this peak. And then you see it's a very complex spectra, but at least you can check again whether the <coughs> major fragments, so you're not anymore limited to the top four here, you can basically search for existence of the other fragments, you can validate whether you're using one of the fragments, you can search whether you're using, whether they have the right charge state, whether they have the right mass accuracy. So you have basically a set of scoring which is exactly the same as in SRM, these are the collusion scores, and on top of that, because you have access to the MSMS spectra at every single time point. You have a, a, another completely new set of scores which are not accessible in SRM that you can use in addition to validate the existence of your peak. So this makes the system a little bit, uh, you, you, you get another set of confidence, let's say, in, a, in, in addition to just the collision scores you need to identify your first issue. So this is the major difference, I would say, compared to SLR. In the first step, what you see is just collusion of traces that you extract from your data. So you don't acquire them. You just acquire everything, and then you extract a posteriori your data sets. You extract the fragments you want. You check whether they collude. And once you have seen a nice collusion of fragments, you can basically open your MSMS spectra and check and score whether this is actually the right species. So this is a big difference compared to 
Switzerland. And this is basically what we call the targeted data extraction. So the data looks very similar to, to SRM. So you get these peaks and you get an additional level of information that you can always access in your data if you want to come back and validate them. So this is just to show you, uh, if you're interested in DIA, so you will have the talk of mine tomorrow. And I think there is this uh, very, very good review that they got published uh, uh, last year from uh, Gutek and Masno. And I would be, if you're interested in DIA, this is the really, uh, most extensive review that was published in the past couple of years. And they comment about all the, if you have a time, line of the different methods developed and uh, so I talked to you about the, the DIA concept from the from the eight, the MSC from waters, our target data analysis, and we think that now the major steps in the future will be basically to develop accurate tools to skyline is going in this direction, this and uh, apply it to the very interesting logical questions that we are still uh, trying to figure out. But if you're interested, I recommend you to read this review, which is a very, very good review, and very well explained, mm -hmm. and very balanced uh, for the different methods. So they explain every method with their advantages and disadvantages, and they are very fair in comparing the different methods. So this is all about the data uh, acquisition, and I, I, I gave you a short introduction about the data analysis, and I will now focus in the next couple of minutes about the um, the targeted data extraction, so that's a method that we developed specifically for SWAT. And I will comment about the performance of these methods, so that you know what you can apply it to or not. And uh, this is basically uh, the summary of the paper that we published in 2012. And this was the paper that basically uh, put the foundation for the targeted data extraction of DIA datasets. And um, yeah, I tried to explain as well as I could the concept of it, but it's maybe still a little bit uh, yeah, confusing. So if you have any questions, please ask at any moment. So the first thing that we, we, we did when we wanted to apply this targeted data extraction was uh, we wanted to apply this 25 data on Windows and keep all sorts. First time we present this is like you're crazy, you're going to get too many co-fragmenting species, and that's true, we do. But then we wanted to recheck very carefully whether we were, we were in the same <coughs> specificity range on SRM or not. And this was the first figure of this paper where we basically, this is simulation we show based on, on, uh, on these fragmentations. What we look, we, we try to look for occurrence of fragment <coughs> and interference with different combinations of precursor and fragment ion isolation windows. So the, for example, in SRM, the typical SRM is big is 07 dot on Q1, 07 dot on Q3. So you have a small uh, isolation window of producer, small isolation window of the fragments. And uh, this is what gives you the selectivity in SRM. So we tried also another SRM, which is 1 dot on Q1, 1 dot on Q3. So the blue and the green basically gives us the, the gold standard SRM specificity range that you see. So the blue and green curves. And in SWATS, we basically now have a Q1, which is much, much larger. It's only a 25 dalton isolation window. But you see as a Q3, it's an artificial Q3. I will explain in a second. But we use now 10 ppm instead of daltons. And you see here, by opening the Q1 and by closing the Q3, you actually recover a <coughs> which is very, very similar to the SRM. While the other DIAs, which is actually uh, larger windows or smaller windows, but it's also larger uh, Q3 windows, they don't mind, they fall off very fast in terms of specificity. So the, how you read this, um, this graph is, is very simple. For example, you want to ask your question, if I have a, if I want to analyze my peptide with five transitions, with five transitions, how many peptides can I actually visualize in my data? without having one of the fragments which is interfered with another species. So we basically took all the tricky factors from these, calculated computationally, so it's a complete theoretical uh, uh, experiment, and we check if the peptides, if both peptides fall in the same Q1 isolation window, if they co fragments simultaneously, what's the chance that two fragments also overlap in the Q3 windows as well? And what you see here, if you think, if you look at the size, you want peptides with five transitions, 
can basically identify 90 to 95% in SLM, while in SWAS, you also exactly in the middle, while you can basically, with other GIA methods, you drop very fast, you can only identify 60% or 20% of your peptide, which means that only 20% of your peptides here will have uh, five transitions that don't interfere on speed that will not interfere with any other peptides for mutation. So this is the basic, the major uh, um, message of this, of this figure was basically that in SWAS, by using, even using a very large isolation window, we managed to contain the specificity and interference to the level of SLM. But the, like the 10 ppm assumption is actually wrong, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, so we do, it's depending on the resolution of the machine, basically. So you can even you can extract the data at 10 ppm, but if your resolution is not at 10 ppm, uh, your peak width in the SMS spectra doesn't have this resolution, you, you might basically extract two species together. This was like more like an exercise type of thing. But I mean, we, we're, right. we're all using like 50 to 100, really, in practice, right? I mean, that's that's what. Hannes agrees with me on. Well, I'd love to see an update of this figure. Yeah. <laughs> I use 50. So 50, yeah. 50 you're right at the bottom here. And uh, yeah. So with the new machines, you get higher resolution. I'm going to try 10 now. But yeah. I, I, I can comment on that maybe later with the drawings that people understand the relationship. This is something that is confusing sometimes, the relationship between mass accuracy and resolution of the machine. There is no point to extract with a very, you can have a very high mass accuracy estimate. So all these are designed on computers or other type of instruments, and you have the mass accuracy of 10 ppm. But if your peak width is not big enough, you basically don't have the, so you're aware about the resolution. So this is what's, because the resolution is basically the peak width at half eight, right? So you can have a very high mass accuracy precision of your measurement. For example, very high precision of the measurement here at the top of the peak. And then you can extract this with 10 ppm. And if you extract this with 10 ppm, you basically extract a very, very narrow window here. And then if by chance in the second injections on the second scan, your peak very, very slightly shifts, <laughs> then you're going to extract the window, which is still the center of the window you want to extract, but you're not going to extract anymore the exact center of the window and make it even worse, just to essentially what you understand. So here, if you extract a very small window of 10 ppm, that doesn't match the resolution of your instrument. So your mass range here might still be within two or three ppm, but however, because your peak resolution is much larger than that, you will basically get a wrong quantification here. So therefore, Brendan has a very good point, and this is actually what we do in practice. We don't extract blindly using the mass accuracy of the instruments. We look at the mass resolution, and if the mass resolution is about like, we, we basically have instruments which are between 20 and 30,000 resolution, in an SMS, so basically, in order to get, we want to acquire, to give a certain tolerance for the top of the peak, so we basically extract now all this region, and therefore, even if the peak slightly shifts, you still get most of the area right underneath. So it's a bit too big, something like this. But then, you want to make such a large mistakes by taking a too small window. So this is where the difference between 50 ppm, for example, and 10 ppm allows you for some, let's say, um, some uh, tolerance in terms of mass accuracy. So this is something that you might want to look into your machine, what's the resolution you can accept, and you want to extract not too narrow, just at the top of the peak, because it's going to be very noisy and very shaky in terms of quantifications, but you rather want to extract a mass range which is consistent with the mass resolution of the other protection, right? So don't always uh, believe that your machine has a very high mass accuracy, they all have now, if you maintain them well calibrated, 
But the vasculation has a very important uh, relationship to the extraction uh, window and to the quantification of the data. So, so the way I explain this is again taking the starting with SLM as an example. And as you can see here, so again you have the, the standard SLM, Q of variables, Q1 filter, Q3 filter. So you filter, you have a lot of precursors that they use for your color metabolism and time map. But because you use a very small filtering of the Q1, you basically get one or two maybe by chance that pass through the first filter, the fragments together. And because you use also a very close filter for Q3, you basically get one or two sometimes fragments that comes out of the filters. So what you measure in SRM is basically transition one, two, three. So sometimes you have transition which are clean, sometimes you have transition which are contaminated. So this is what makes the shoulders in your SRM fix typically if you're used to see SRM traces. So these transitions can also be contaminated in SRM. <coughs> you have seen how noisy sometimes the signal is speaking. And the idea is that in SWAS, we now open the Q1 filter much larger. So instead of having two, one or two species, we have 10 or 20 species together that gets through these 25,000 species. We co fragment all simultaneously together. But then, since we don't use the Q3 filters, but we use a top mass analyzer, a long track, for example, which is doing the Q exactly, we can basically get this extraction of the white branch, exactly what I showed on the blackboard, on the whiteboard here. And we can basically, uh, just restrict yourself in the MSMA space to whatever you want. So now instead of adding uh, one Dalton in the MS2 range, you basically have a much narrower window in MS2 range. So some of the transitions that were contaminated before in SRM, you basically get them uh, transition free again. And of course, this is only one part of the equation because the, complete, the fragmentation spectra is highly multiplex, so you get MSMS fragments of of many more species than you have in SRM. So of course you have uh, also by chance uh, transitions of your peptide, the green peptide that is also contaminated by other species. But the good thing is that because you have the whole MSM spectrum, you still always have the chance to select another contaminate through contamination through transitions. So you can do this also, I will show you later, a bit recursively. So as soon as you find a contaminated transition in SWAS, what you can do, you can remove this transition and add another one. So this is really the big advantage that you have basically more options in the MSMS space in order to, to pick <coughs> the transition that you want to quantify and to, to use for identifications. So I hope with this you, you see a little bit uh, similarity and when I'm speaking about like what's the specificity, so how many, uh, how many Peptide can you observe with two or three transitions in SRM, and how many peptides can you observe with two or three transitions in SWAS? At the end, the number is very similar because even though we open much more the Q1 window, we close so much the Q3 window that we basically narrow what the space of what we observe in the SMS spectrum, and we also do have definitely a lot of contaminations. There are ways in the machine side, like the Macros group has developed, to try to reduce this as much as possible. But the, the big message is always that you have the whole MSMS spectrum, and then you have basically more chance to have basically uh, contamination free transitions, and, and as much chance that you have in SMS spectrum. So this was the first message. The second message, I don't want to spend too long about this. It's for you to know that SWAS is not as sensitive as SRM. I'm never going to claim this. It's about 10 times less sensitive than SRM. But it's more sensitive than shotgun identification. So you lose basically the identification of, of shotgun peptides. The peptide is not picked anymore for MS and MS spectra around one ten to one. While basically in MS1 level three, you can still detect a bit of the precursor, one or two steps more, but it's not anymore picked for, for, for MS and MS identification. So the detection limit in MS1 level three is to see the precursor sub ten to more. And in SWAS, because we're looking for fragments, you actually have another little bit of more sensitivity. And you're a little bit more sensitive than, than MS1 uh, on the precursor level. And then SRM, I don't have the SRM plot here. SRM is one step more below. So basically, you have 
you have about five to ten fold more sensitivity in SRM. This is very cheap because in SRM you spend more time and more focus on the precursor you want. So you have a little bit uh, more sensitivity in terms of dynamic range, etc. So SWAS, I would never claim it's as sensitive as in SRM, it has other advantages. But it's just to tell you that SWAS in sensitivity, sensitivity wise, it's in between really shotgun and SRM. So SRM is still always the most sensitive and SWAS in between. And uh, the last figure of this paper was basically uh, an example of quantification of the sets of proteins that, um, uh, involved in dioxic shift in means. And then we quantify two different time points of dioxic shift, an early and a late time points after the dioxic shift. And we basically quantify the protein symbol. And we see the upregulation or downregulation of certain proteins to turn on and off the dioxic shift. And we compare this quantification accuracy to the same peptide, the same assay is used also in SRM. And we actually find a very good correlation in quantification uh, between the swaths and SRM. So this is basically the message of this paper was we are, in principle, as specific, not that quite as well, not quite as specific, but almost, not quite as sensitive. But you can also achieve the same similar um, um, detection accuracy and detection level as in SRM. So this was the proof of principle by using a very small number of peptides and a very small number of proteins. So here, this is exactly one to one compared to SRM. So in the next couple of slides, I want to show you why SWAS actually bringing something more than SRM. And the big advantage is that, I don't know if some of you have already done SRM, once you have quantified your first pathway, and then you, you as a, because you're a biologist or another biologist that for which you, you measure this protein, say, oh, it's nice, but you know, this protein is also involved in another pathway, and I want to measure this other pathway. You say, but it's too late, now your data has been measured in SRM, I have to remeasure everything again with another set of samples. And um, that's the beauty of data independent acquisition is basically that you don't need to reacquire your data. You have MS and spectra of all the species. So what you can basically, you can now go to another region of your spectra with another set of assays and you can basically do another completely different set of peptides and proteins extractions. So this you do in the same sample, in the same data set without reacquiring your data. So this is to me a big advantage compared to, to SRM, is that once you have acquired your data, you can basically try to query it as many times as you need in order to extract new information without needing to reach at the same time. So this is really like a big advantage compared to SRM. While in SRM, <coughs> you're stuck with the one that you acquired, then you cannot go beyond that. And here you can really try to reanalyze your data and re-query new questions and recheck new peptides. So this is another example where you would say in SRM you're kind of stuck, right? You have like three transitions. It's not so bad. I mean, you have six, seven, and eight of that peptide. But then you get two peaks which have exactly the same relative intensities. And they're within one, one minute to meet those. So in SRM, you would say like <coughs> retention time doesn't tell me much. Relative intensity doesn't tell me much. I don't know what is my peptides. And in SRM, you will need basically to require your data, add more transitions, and remeasure your sample. And in SWAS, you don't need to remeasure it, you just pick another set of two transitions, and then you see that you have six transitions that were built here, while here you actually the three new transitions you basically drop out here. And then you can also, because it's GIA, <coughs> you, you have always access to the MSMS underneath these peaks. You can basically look at the MS and S spectra, identify and confirm that this was the right peptide, while here you could basically search and identify that this is actually the wrong peptide with completely different sequence. So this is basically uh, always you can do this on the fly, on the same sample, don't need to require the data. So this is the big advantage. So you can do this <coughs> recursive data mining in order to validate your peptide identifications. So this is for peptide ID. And you can do the same, of course, for peptide quantifications. So this is an example of a peptide light and heavy. This is at 14 and 15 minutes. And as you can see here, you have a very strong contaminations of the Y11 tubules here. And uh, well, here, the contamination will not be too bad if you manage to quantify it. But in practice, what you would like to do is basically to remove this transition away 
and then to pick up another transition to do better quantifications. And in SRM, again, you will need to reacquire your data, while in SMART, you basically remove it from your data, you pick up another transition, and by 8 now, you replace it, and then you can quantify light and heavy very accurately. You don't need to worry anymore about contaminations. And again, this you can do dynamically without needing to reacquire your data. And the last example, and this is going to be now the topic of Agile, so I don't want to uh, interfere and overlap too much with this talk. This was, just to give you an impression, this was the very first example I found in my data, the first time I looked into it. So I actually found that you can actually use also for uh, completely history of peptides quantification by chance. But you can see here, these were like eight fragments of a peptide. And uh, from here, you see the two peaks are like five minutes away. And they are exactly the same relative intensity. And that's in the same two shapes. So it's almost impossible to distinguish which is the right peptide. So it's what's like in most of the, in most of the GIA. You also have access to the MS1 information. So you can extract the MS1 signals. And you can validate that the mass of these peptides here, 581, was clearly the second peak here. So the question is still, what's the first one? And then if you look a little bit into your data, you can manage actually to identify that it's the oxidation, oxidative species here. And because the metaline was at the very end of the peptide sequence, all the YN series were on that side, were actually shared completely, exactly the same mass, exactly the same relative intensities between those peptides. And that was the first time I actually figured out that you could use this information snappy. So some people think that it's a drawback, and it definitely is because it's very confusing at first when you see that. But I really take it like a, a huge advantage and I'm really trying hard now to make this a very valuable information that you can extract from this one <coughs> data sets in order to identify new modifications of peptides. So here it was kind of an obvious modification, but I will show you later today some examples where we can actually not even guess what's the modification of the peptides. So I would really, I think that show this as an advantage of SWAS extraction as well, that you can basically completely, completely serendipitously detect modification on peptides like this by extracting transitions and then you see mythical peaks and then you can start to wonder what the other peaks and whether you should use or not that peptide for transportation. That's it, another topic about it. So <coughs> I'm running out of time. <coughs> So this is to show you that now, because we are speaking about high strict targeted proteomics, you basically don't, you cannot really afford to do this by hand anymore. Like in this one, you do like 100 targets, you check them by hand on Skyline, etc. And here you need like more of an advanced, like high strict automatic identification pipeline. And what we have now, we have seen this on this one. There are many, many scores that you can basically use. There is a chromatographic scores like pollution, big shapes, Pollution with reference spectra, uh, heat shape with reference spectra, uh, assays from your libraries, uh, uh, correspondence between light and heavy reference spectra, reference intensity, retention time information, intensity scores. All these scores you can basically now use them in an automated tool. And this was implemented originally in SLM for us in our group with MCOPEC. And you can basically use this, each of these mean information in order to store. And you can basically compute the score for each of the peptides check, and then check the same scores for decoy assays, and then manage to find this type of plots where you can basically have exactly like you done in shotgun, the distribution of two targets and the distribution of four targets, and identify with high confidence, one person to the story rate, what the identification of my target is. We are going to speak about this more this afternoon and tomorrow. And I think this is a very important point because you cannot do this manually anymore because it's so much data set so you start to extract like 10,000 or 20,000 assays. You need a software that does this automatically for you that search, that scores the peak shapes, solution, that scores the right intensities, etc. <coughs> so this is now done with automatic tools like the Uncorpet is now embedded also uh, in Skyline. And you will have a tutorial this afternoon also to know how to run this in Skyline. So the big point about this is about, is about decoys. So I want to make very clear basically what the decoys in SOM are, or in s are. And this is conceptually very different than the decoys in Shotgun. So the, 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 the concept of decoys is, is a bit similar from the beginning. 
And they, they are assays, which are long natural sequence, exactly like you have a shotgun decoy database. Uh, so the, the decoy peptide sequence should not exist in nature. And you are going to, to extract them from your data. So they must look to the software exactly like targets. So the software itself should not be able to distinguish what is the target and what is the target. It should blindly try them both, test them both. <coughs> And only when you actually see a decoy that is really overlapping very well with your false politics, then you can actually be sure that you have a good decoy strategies. But I don't want to enter into details here. We'll speak about it also in the second talk in the library generation. We use a shuffle of pseudo decoy decoy strategy now, which gives us the best basically decoy strategy in order to identify your peptides. And the big thing is that in SRM, if you want to do this type of automatic data analysis, you need to acquire your decoys, which costs double amount of time and which is very costly in terms of SRM application. While in SWAT, you can basically ask and query as many decoys as you want, like targets. And the idea again is not like in shotgun, you want to assess the quality of your SRM spectra. Here, you want to, uh, to assess the chance that certain fragment items could be by chance. And this is a very different meaning than in shotgun. So I tried to show you an example of what it means in terms of, of, of target and decoy extraction. So this is a target peptide. You use four transitions. This is first step. You extract them from your data. You get a very nice peak. You score this peak position-wise very good. The relationship to the, to the assay reference library is very good. You get a score, which is the number which it gives. And now you do in parallel, completely independent from your target extraction, you basically now extract the reverse sequence of that peptide. As you can see, it's the exact same peptide. You just reverse the peptide sequence. So you maintain the exact same fragment that you're looking for. But you see, because you reverse the peptide sequence, the fragments, the Y7 has a completely different mass, Y8 has a completely different mass, etc., etc. So these masses together in nature should not exist in the same peptide species. They might exist in other peptides, as you can see here, there are other peaks that pop up at certain masses. But they, all four together, should not coexist in the same peptide species because this is a decoy peptide that should not exist in nature, right? So when you extract this completely wrong decoy assay, what you get is basically an extraction, exactly like you do the extraction of assays, but you extract decoy signals that should not exist in nature. And basically here, you see that you have peaks, some peaks all over the place. And what the software does, it tries to store and identify the most likely peak in that picture, right? And the most likely peak in that picture, it decides it's this one. It gives you also a certain score. And here you see that the score is much lower than this one. And all the trick now is not, so we don't do like in shotgun, we don't compare the targets to the decoys. We basically, like, like they do in shotgun, they compare the spectra, the <coughs> spectra to a decoy database. Here we basically acquire or uh, extract assays, real assays, we extract decoy assays, and then we basically compare their scores together. So then you basically have this target peptide scores very high, this decoy peptide scores very low, and this you do it for many, many peptides with many, many different species. So you do this for, if you extract 10,000 peptides, you extract 10,000 decoys. So at the end you see that all your decoys kind of cluster uh, with a certain distributions rather on the low score range. And most of your targets, they cluster with a rather high score, a distribution with a rather high score range. So you see that, for example, this peptide here compared to the former one, so this one was minus one pi, and you see that this peptide is actually scoring already borderline. So you see that this peptide score has bad as the decoys of the other example. This decoy scores even worse because it's a bit looks even worse. But it's just to tell you that sometimes even the targets will look to the software pretty bad, and some decoys will look pretty good. And therefore, you get this type of distribution. So some decoys look pretty good, and then they start to go inside the target's distributions. And some target looks pretty bad, and they start to go into the decoy distributions. And all the trick is basically you want to do this enough times in order to, to get the feeling about what's the overall score distributions of my targets, what's the overall distribution score of my decoys, and what is the situation where I start to say like, okay, by chance I have many, many decoys that start to look like a real peaks of this level, so I stop here taking my, my targets because I think even though I have some targets that looks 
theorems of this and score, they are unfortunately, they, they are, I have too many decoys at this level that also looks like good peaks. So I don't want to, to, to take these targets anymore in my data sets. So all the tricks is basically here with this method. So you extract targets, you extract decoys, you look at these distributions, and then you want to stop taking the scores of your targets when you start to have too many decoys that cuts to the side. So at no moment you compare directly targets and decoys. I want to say you really compare globally the target distributions, the decoy distributions, and there is no match between targets and decoys like you do in shotgun, so it's conceptually very different. So each of them will consider like in different assays, the software doesn't have any way to distinguish those, it just scores them completely independently from each other, and it's only at the end that you manage to make sense of it. So this is very important for SWAT. This is very important for this also in SCRM. Conceptually, it's, uh, it's the same, but I want you to emphasize that it's very different than shotgun database. And the big the difference is, is this, is basically that if you do a shotgun database, you have good quality spectra that will mostly match your targets. The medium quality spectra will have certain propensity to match also the decoys. And the bad quality spectra, which are very, very noisy, etc. By definition, they are random matches, and they can randomly match 50% chance to the targets and 50% chance to the decoys. So this is the concept in shotgun, right? And this is something that everybody is very familiar about, and this reads out basically the quality of the spectrum. <coughs> the decoys basically provide you an impression about what the quality of my match, of my spectra, against the database. And the big the difference here I want to point out is that the decoy captures basically the, the size of the database and the search parameters complexity. So the more like variable modifications, the more you increase your search space and the more you increase basically the targets and the decoy space. But if you search 10,000 spectra, whether you search ten, one spectra against a set of database and decoys or whether you search 10,000 spectra, you will search it against the same size of targets and decoys. So the size of the targets and decoys do not increase with the more data sets that you search. And this is very different in shotgun. So I showed you in SWAS. In SWAS, you basically extract your target per time, you extract your decoy per time. And now the big problem is that if you do this, the decoy is basically what it gives you. It gives you a feeling about the sample noise that you have in your sample. So basically the decoys tell you what's the chance that four transitions in that mass region, in that time regions, will use by chance together. So if the chance that random transitions could use with a good score is as high as my target, then we can say I don't trust anymore my target, right? So this is what decoys is about in, in SWAS and SLM. So the decoys do not capture anymore the, the search parameters, capture really the background sample complexity. And the big problem here is that the number of decoys increase with the number of targets. So here, whether you search one best spectra, for 10,000 spectra, you're going to match it to the same size of targets and decoys. While here, when you search one target, you will compare it to one decoy. And if you search 40,000 targets, you compare it to 40,000 decoys. And this is very important. When you do this, you have to correct for multiple hypotheses. And this is a very important uh, thing to do here because the size, the number of decoys that you're extracting is increasingly, is dynamically increasing with the number of targets that you extract. So this is something which is very important. Conceptually, the decoys capture very different concepts than in SWAS in, in, in shotgun. And therefore, you need also to think about them a little bit differently. So this is not a match. This is really a specific assay that you store. And it gives you a feeling about the, the sample <coughs> complexity in this region of the spectrum. So I'm not going to speak about the software. So Skyline is the one that you're going to use this afternoon. Now they have embedded and implemented all these scores. And you can do this automatic scoring and distributions you will see this afternoon. And this is to show you that now the method starts to be used in a high throughput manner in our lab. So this is our paper from our lab. These are human uh, affinity purification samples. Uh, glyco capture, so glyco enrich. This is the spectrocopus yeast. Uh, the data from all the house, so now it's MTB. We have the mouse lysates, and you see that the number of proteins is not as high as in shotgun, but it's a reasonable number. And as you can see here, this is a number that you can never reach basically in SRM, except by injecting a sample many, many times. 
So, and to go beyond the, the game about the identification number, we are never going to beat shotgun, this is clear. But what I really want to emphasize that what we beat shotgun on is about the <coughs> system quantifications. And you see, this is the quantification matrix that you get out of these thousand, two thousand uh, species. You see that the matrix is almost completely complete. So it's like this, I am right. There is no, almost no missing data point. So this is the data from the PMS data set. This is the data from the data samples. And this is the data which I'm working on now. This is POSCO data. And as you can see, I try really my best to do the shotgun label quantification as good as I could. It's 10,000 POSCO peptides, which I extract in shotgun MS1 level 3, and it's was. And as you can see, the, the data is much more sparse in shotgun than in squats. So you, you also get the feeling that here, basically get a much better consistency of quantification for samples. And you get a much better than a statistical uh, significance about the form change, a better clustering of the samples together than in shotgun, etc. Et so you're not going to beat shotgun in terms of identification, but we are going to gain is you, you bring in the consistent quantification of SRM to a very high number of identifications that you do almost like each other. So this is the final slide, sorry I'm a bit late. So this was basically the message about this SWAS, and it's about the AI engineer. As soon as you apply this target to data analysis, you basically now want, so this is the new shift that we want to do now, we shift from targeted data acquisition, so we compare targeted data acquisition with SRM, mm -hmm. targeted data analysis, where you can do this recursively in many, many times. So I showed you some performance, um, it's the selectivity is similar to SRM, sensitivity is less than SRM, but it's still quite good. And you get a good quantification accuracy. And the idea is really that you bring the consistency and accuracy of SRM to the high number of proteins observable in, uh, in short term. And I wanted to point out today really the advantages of SWAS and the area targeted data extraction compared to SRM. You don't need to prepare your SRM methods in advance. You just acquire your sample and you extract them afterwards. You don't lose any time for measurements of decoys. You can confirm the method of notification by using the MS2 spectrum that you have underneath each of your data points at every, every time point. You can dynamically substitute and change the contaminated condition to refine identification and refine quantification. You can basically realize the data as many times as you want. Now that you have your protein identified, you can look for SNPs, you can look for modifications, so you can do many, many recursive searching once you have identified your first steps of targets. And you can also look for modification <coughs> steps, and this is what Ian is going to speak about today. And again, all these without the need to inject a sample like you need to do in this way, you just have your file, you just re-extract it as much as you want. And this is the sample the people from the IMSB in our group in Zurich. People that help in the lab, they found that we work hard in the bioinformatics. The science people that help in the machine and the software. And of course, Brenda and Dario for implementing all this also now in Skyline. So you're going to see how to apply these methods also in Skyline this afternoon. Thank you. Sorry for the. Time.